Today is April 20th, 2022. Welcome to Native Calgarian. Oki, Naganako, Mekoche, Che Stokom Aki, or Dekots, Nagotene, Seku. My name is Red Wonder Woman. My married English name is Michelle Robinson, and I use she and her pronouns. I'm speaking to you on the lands of the Nitsitapi, which is the Blackfoot Confederacy. The Blackfoot south of the imposed US Canadian border are the Blackfeet. North of the border are the Siksika, Gunai, and Bagani of the Confederacy. These lands are Treaty 7, signed September 22nd, 1877, with signatures that include the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Wesley Chiniki and Bears Paw Nations of the Stony Nations, and the Dene from Sutina. My Dene lineage roots me in the land of the hair people, like, like the rabbit, uh, also called Great Bear Lake Tribe in Treaty 11. I'm a native to Turtle Island and my Dene nation is a visitor to this area of Tincho Tine Indehe in Satu Dene, meaning many horse town, named after the stampede. I was born in Calgary or in Blackfoot Mokinstis as Michelle Elliott, another English name which has afforded me privilege in an English colonial world. My mother is Northern Slavey Dene or Satu Dene, but my Indian Act imposed status card by the Canadian government says Yellowknives Dene. My father um, is makes me a daughter of the Mayflower and a daughter of the American Revolution while having an Indian Act imposed star, status card by the Canadian government. That's a colonial construct by Canadian policy meant to divide Indigenous peoples' inherent rights. Indigenous Two-Spirit or the LGBTQ2 plus community and Indigenous women are on the bottom of the Canadian socio-economic ladder because of colonial trauma, imposed poverty, racism, gendered violence, and land theft. I acknowledge all First Nation, Métis, Inuit, status and non-status across Turtle Island as the keepers of these lands. All non-Indigenous are treaty partners with the government signing on your behalf. Land acknowledgements are critical to creating a safe space for Indigenous, as well as honoring the host as a guest and acknowledging your role as a treaty partner in a so-called time of reconciliation. It's important that your land acknowledgements have meaning. I encourage all people to introduce themselves with the acknowledgement of their ancestors, stories of displacement, and how you perceive your role as a treaty partner, a citizen of Canada, a refugee, or other land displacement. So we as Indigenous people know how safe you are to be around. If you don't know how to pronounce the local Indigenous nations names, if you won't say your story of origin, if you won't acknowledge stolen lands, imposed economic oppression, or your role in reconciliation, I determine how safe you are to be around for my community, my family, and myself. As a Denny woman who attempted to run after joining harmful colonial parties, spent money at those expensive conventions and traveled to them just to vote on incomplete drug policies that still allow for incarceration, a denial of justice, a denial of health services, racism, colonial violence, trauma, and genocide of Indigenous and Black peoples, I have work to continue, reports to advocate for, and attempt to work within these systems meant to harm me and my community. I can't say happy 420 day when I know my community is dying from the current drug policies and systems of imposed Christian-based drug policies, abstinence programming, private health care, and justice systems built on racism, land theft, and imposed British constructs, continuing genocide on Indigenous peoples. I think of all of those folks that have fallen today, all of those who are incarcerated, as, and I hope we honour their lives. I hope that you all see your role in the importance of stopping harm, and as a citizen, see your role in reconciliation with Indigenous people. I honour the Blackfoot as the Elders and members have been kind to me on my Red Rogue journey. Elder Red Crane taught me how to pronounce my name in Blackfoot, and Leonard Kenny taught me how to pronounce my spirit name in Satu Dene. My humblest apologies to the Blackfoot and Dene elders and language keepers as I try to learn proper pronunciation. Any mistakes or misinterpretations will be on me. I encourage questions so that misunderstandings about everything on this podcast can be cleared up as soon as possible. I do not speak on behalf of all Indigenous, but I just share my journey on the red road. My patron account is Native Calgarian, where you can pledge and support. Thank you to the previous donors for showing your support. If you value listening or watching and can afford to give, thank you. 
To those who cannot afford to give, I'd just love to hear from you at nativeyyc at gmail.com, where you can send in your comments or your questions. Also, giving a review helps whatever medium you're listening from. I have a YouTube channel that you can go subscribe to, or you can go to nativecalgarian.com for the latest podcasts and pin posts on social media. And today I am super excited to have the guests I have. Um, I will probably go around and we'll go with um, Abby, Molly, and Vicki. Okay, hi. <laughs> thanks, Michelle. Thanks for thanks so much for having me on. Uh, my name is Abby Stadnik. I'm a white settler. I'm currently living in uh, Treaty 6 territory and Métis homeland in uh, Amiskwichi, West Guyon, uh, also known as Edmonton, Alberta. Um, in terms of my sort of roots, uh, I'm originally from Winnipeg, Manitoba. And I have Ukrainian and Belgian uh, ancestry, but I would say like many white people, I'm very disconnected from that, from that ancestry. So um, there are implications to think through with that for sure. Uh, but thank you, Michelle, for your, for your introduction and for inviting, inviting me to think uh, further about, about that and how I, how I locate myself. I'm uh, grateful, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I think that's really important. Um, I could say more, maybe I could say more about uh, my, what I do that intersects with our, with our topic for today. Uh, do I can say that now? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm a member of Freelance Free Peoples, as Molly is as well. Uh, and Freelance Free Peoples is an Indigenous led anti-colonial abolition group. Uh, and we've worked together uh, and done some organizing and uh, public education and support of people who are incarcerated in Saskatchewan and Alberta primarily um, over the last couple of years. Uh, we're also part of SMAC, S-M-A-A-C, which stands for the Saskatchewan Manitoba Alberta Abolition Coalition, uh, which also arose in the last uh, two years and it's a, a prairie coalition of abolitionists we're continuing to sort of formulate a prairie specific abolitionist uh, theory and, and praxis. So uh, I'll, I'll leave it there, but thank you for, for having us. And those are partners we want, that's for sure. Uh, Molly, would you like to introduce yourself too? Sure. Um, so Tanse, uh, Molly Swain, Nitsigasan Otusquanik, Nitotsen, Amiskwati Wiskagen, Otsi. Uh, so, hello, my name is Molly Swain. Uh, I'm a Métis woman. I was actually born and raised in Calgary or Tusquanic uh, in, in the Cree. Um, and currently I'm living in beautiful uh, Edmonton, Alberta, which is, as Abby mentioned, uh, Treaty 6, uh, Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 4, and Nahiel Poit, uh territory. And uh, along with Abby and another comrade of ours, uh, I'm a member of Freelance Free Peoples and uh, very, very happy uh, to be chatting with you today. Oh, oh I'm, uh, go ahead. Sorry, I just I realized I should maybe situate myself a little bit more. Um, my family is, um, I mean, originally, uh, as many Métis families, sort of from the Red River, uh, White Horse Plains region, Wood Mountain, um, and our story of displacement sort of sees us, you know, through the various waves of Canadian Western expansion, uh, moving further west, um, eventually ending up in uh, St. Peter's Mission, Montana, uh, Skull Creek's Skull Creek, Saskatchewan, and the Cypress Hills region. And then my grandfather uh, ended up moving the family uh, to Calgary in the mid 20th century. And we have been in Calgary uh, ever since. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much, Molly. I appreciate that. And Vicki, would you like to introduce yourself in your way? Yeah, thanks, Michelle. And so great to be with in presence with Abby and Molly. But um, and inspired by Michelle's uh, situating yourself, I, I thought that was really brilliant. And, and um, I myself, I'm on Abenaki territory, which is also known as Sherbert, Quebec. It is part of the Wabanaki Confederacy, but this is Abenaki territory. But I'm actually originally from um, Anishinaabek territory, which is uh, not too not too far from where the great Art Solomon is from, which was Algonquin Park, or also known as Sudbury around Sudbury, on, Ontario. And uh, Art was actually a, a leader when it came to uh, Indigenous incarceration and advocating for people inside. And, and we know that's only gotten worse today um, in many respects. 
but um, I, I'm not a member of Freelance Free Peoples, but I, I actually uh, collaborate and coordinate with, with Molly and Abby on, on many fronts. And I'm a member of the Justice Exchange, and this is where we work with folks who don't have access to justice. And that could be anyone from, you know, certainly clearly the uh, you know, murdered and missing Indigenous women, what, uh, you know, my chapter is with the book that uh, Abby had published. Uh, co-published and co-edited with some folks, but also with people and folks in prison. And so we just try to find ways to improve the quality of people's lives. And justice seems to be really, really a really important factor in all that. Yeah, no kidding. Oh, thank you so much for that introduction. All to all of you, I appreciate you, you know, explaining where you're from because I'm hoping that our listeners who we have, um, we just hit the mark where Ontario is just beating Alberta now. So we, I know like we're getting a lot of folks nationally listening, but when I hear people say their land acknowledgements, I'm just like, I don't think you quite get it yet. <laughs> but very clearly everybody here does. And for obvious reasons that everybody knows the work that they're doing. So. Abby, do you want to tell me about your book and how it got published and, and anything about how it came to be, what it was like trying to collaborate with other people? I, I just want to ask you a million questions. So rather than me do that, I'll just let you take the mic and just tell the process by by your perspective. Yeah, for sure. But it's certainly it's certainly not my book. I'm super uncomfortable with that <laughs> with that phrasing, just because uh, I'm, I'm one of the editors here along with Shiri Pasternak and Kevin Welby, but really the book was a, a collective effort and the editors that I, I feel, I feel comfortable enough to, to say this on behalf of all the editors, really we did sort of administrative work, we did some editing work, we did some sort of coordination work, um, but I would say that it's mainly a project for, for the editors of gathering people together who are already doing this uh, fantastic work uh, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd uh, by Minneapolis police in 2020 and coming out of coming out of that and the um, continuing movement for black lives, uh, the just the explosion of abolitionist work across the country. Um, particularly, I mean, this book is focused, uh, sorry, this book, Disarm, Defund, Dismantle Police Abolition in Canada, is focused quite heavily on um, police abolition and police defunding. But of course, that's situated in a larger analysis uh, that looks at the intersection of carceral systems, the prison system, uh, social work, et cetera. So the, the book sort of takes that takes that perspective and looks at the intersection of, of colonial carceral uh, systems that displace uh, Indigenous and other uh, people, Black people, people of color, um, displace people, uh, remove them to uh, to these colonial institutions, fracture families and, and communities, etc. So really, I, I'm uncomfortable with it as my book. I can speak to the contents of the book, sort of. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely don't want to take credit for any of the wonderful uh, material that's in here. Wonderful. No, that I, I really appreciate you how you put, frame that. And, and thank you so much. And, and Molly, kind of the same questions to you. Like, what are your thoughts on the book? How did you come together with it? What are some contributions that you felt that were needed that maybe whatever gaps you want to talk about in any capacity, please don't hesitate. Yeah, and I mean, I'm, I'm sure Abby and Vicky can speak really well to this um, as well. Uh, but I think, you know, the time was past ripe, I think for an anthology like this, uh, that's situated specifically within uh, the context of so-called Canada. Uh, we know that abolitionist, penal abolitionist work has been happening uh, here for, you know, almost as long or possibly as long as it's been happening in, in the United States. Um, but the conversation does tend to be fairly American focused, which obviously is totally fine. Um, they have some serious, uh, you know, the, the prison industrial complex down there is, is such a behemoth. Um, but, uh, you know, it was sort of past time to, to be discussing how this manifests in so-called Canada. Uh, you know, one of the greatest myths of the state 
uh, here is that somehow we're better or nicer or more gentle uh, than the US, right? So, you know, myths um, and lies like there wasn't slavery or colonialism was nicer here or, you know, um, the cops are nicer here, or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, are still so pervasive, right? And, and as abolitionists, you run into those sort of narratives or people, um, you know, repeating those lies often. Uh, so it was really great to sort of see um, and to see, you know, uh, some of this work and some of this analysis uh, really come out. I think there's some really important pieces in this book. Um, you know, I think uh, all of the conversations around defunding and, and abolition um, that have sort of sprung up in the wake of, you know, uh, the murder of George Floyd and, and other folks in the US, uh, as well as police murders uh, within sort of these borders. Um, you know, these narratives are starting to really coalesce around uh, sort of specific interventions, right? So this idea that, um, you know, we need to put this money towards, you know, we'll defund the police, but we need to put the money towards social workers, for example, or, you know, there are these certain populations that are affected in these specific ways. And so this is how we need to be centering this. So we need to be thinking of one of the things I love about this book is I think there's an incredibly broad range of perspectives that are brought in an incredible amount of myth busting that happens as well. Um, when Abby approached um, myself and our comrade Carrie about potentially contributing to this collection, um, a big part of how she framed it was that this is going to be a lot of people's first introduction to the idea of, the, uh, of defunding police in Canada. Um, and so I think that the book, you know, it does a really good job of sort of those abolitionist ABCs, if you will, um, but I think it really drives at the heart of really specific, pragmatic, practical work that's happening on the ground today, as well as that really specific analysis that has sort of been lacking within the broader public imagination um, for a long time. So I think those are sort of two key pieces for me about this book that I'm especially excited about. Oh, I'm so excited to hear that. I want to elaborate on that immediately and talk about how the TRC has the justice component and we have the 231 calls to justice. And it's like, but there's no real dissection of that, but I don't wanna keep going when, when I wanna hear about Vicky's journey with the book and uh, her thoughts about how, um, you know, what it was like to contribute to this, what, what your, your thoughts of the entire book were, what were pieces that you wanted to focus on. I, I just can't wait to hear your perspective too, Vicky. Thanks, Michelle. And just building off of Abby and, and Molly, it, I've been doing abolition work for, oh wow, probably since 25 years. I stepped into my first, uh, into a, uh, the prison about 25 years ago and then became an abolitionist uh, almost from the onset from that. And um, to be honest, it's the first time, uh, I would say going off of George Floyd, the post-George Floyd and the COVID um, epidemic where we started to see some space being created for discussions around abolition. And most of the folks that I've worked with around abolition, we've operated in silos. There's, there, are, you know, my work has always been so peripheral. Like, God, I never get invited to a podcast to talk about abolition. You know what I mean? And in fact, if anything, I wouldn't say abolition. I'd, I'd talk about what abolition is, but I would never actually say the words. Or, right. So, and it's like this. It's really amazing for the first time that there's like not only are we talking about abolition and defunding the police. Like, there's actually a space for it, and that people and it's and it's actually dominating the conversation and people are hungry for it and they're coming to you know like I get calls to, to and I know Molly does and I know Abby does I'm getting calls to talk about it because people want to learn more and it's um it's so refreshing it's so nice that there's so much space has been created for that but we still get bogged down in a lot of these colonial infrastructures and these bureaucratic infrastructures and you know you know while so while on the on the on the international scene there's this decolonization or abolition calls, you know, you're still struggling in your own backyard, whether it's academia and these bureaucracies of taking down the taking down the colonial house, right? So on one hand, these books are so important. And on the other hand, you're like, just read this book. You want to go back to your, you know, back to your colleagues and just read the book. Right. Oh my goodness. I will, first of all, I'm grateful for this. Go ahead, Abby. Oh, I was just I was just going to jump in because I'm the kind of person that says something and then thinks of all the things that I should have said. So you're on uh, the right podcast for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good. Um, one of the things about the book that I think is really special uh, is that in terms of the contributors, it's a it's a mix of people with uh, firsthand experience of the of the systems, uh, the impact of the systems that we're talking about, the impact of criminalization and incarceration. 
uh, and their first person voices represented as well as academic voices. And I'm not trying to say that those things are mutually exclusive either. There's people who inhabit multiple, multiple identities and spaces, but it's a really nice mix, I think, of people from different uh, places who are doing abolitionist work in grassroots ways, but also some who are uh, doing research work, abolitionist work. Uh, I think that's, I think it's really special because it's not, it's not sort of a straightforward uh, academic book. Uh, and it, it calls to mind, actually, there was a Briarpatch magazine put out um, a special issue on abolition, and we had a launch for that issue. And Anne Hansen was on the launch. Anne Hansen, like longtime um, anarchist, uh, former prisoner at um, Prison for Women, et cetera. She was on, sorry, this is a long side story, but she was on that launch and she was talking about sort of her long history with abolition uh, and the fact that there's been a turn more recently towards abolition that's founded in, in the academy or that, that draws a lot on, on academics. Uh, and, and I think that that, you know, and she had a really brilliant analysis about why that is in terms of who's allowed into prisons, for example, um, uh, censorship, et cetera, around uh, in, inside the prisons, like increased censorship. But anyway, I'm just, what I guess what I'm trying to get to is, you know, there's this predominance of academic voices sometimes. I think this book is important because it's also gesturing towards the importance of uh, First person voices, people with uh, lived experience uh, of these of these systems and their harms. Oh, I, I think that's incredibly important. It, I mean, <sighs> academics have a lot of theory sometimes, but they don't have a lot of practical understanding. But like you said, it's not that everyone is mutually exclusive from certain spaces, and it's important to work together with folks who understand both. Um, but to have folks talk about that journey, I think, uh, matters as well in order to give it legitimacy about some of the concepts that people are talking about. Um, you know, I invite you all to unmute and we can just kind of have a, a free conversation. Um, my last podcast was about the uh, push here in Calgary by the Calgary uh, Police um, Seniors Association and the association that is, it's like a union for the Calgary Police and they're so against even just taking off the blue line patch, uh, so much so that this association, this union, like literally gave out more when they said, take it away. And, um, you know, we had a year of the commission gun giving um, education about why it was so harmful. And uh, still, obviously, people committed to misunderstanding and people committed to racism and discrimination, you know, being so strong on keeping that patch. And, um, you know, so these are our issues. And, and I, I sit with uh, a circle that that does ad advisory from the indigenous and you know trying to talk about the 94 calls to action 231 calls to justice and just feeling like we can't seem to get anywhere um you know small movements have happened more recently under this recent chief where we even have an eagle feather now finally people can do a swearing in on if they identify as indigenous but the majority of indigenous people on the force don't feel comfortable identifying as indigenous because it's not safe um, and these are cops, like these are police, they're supposed to be brothers, sisters, you know, um, and let alone the rest of us who have to deal with the consequences of them being very trigger happy. Um, so I live in, in Abbeydale, which is um, part of the greater forest lawn area and uh, really stigmatized area in the media yeah. propaganda piece. Um, the police have to my face called it um, loser loop and to my face said that this area is a war zone so that that's the type of so-called policing we're getting right and and there was um a story that it, it was I think it was metro news before they shut down they had shown the amount of carding for people of color in our area compared to the rest of the city right like a, the, to say the issue of racism is it, it's so i can sit here and tell you about you know uh sonny crazy bull i can tell you about mm -hmm. uh, robin fiddler people who were indigenous who were just shot and murdered by the police no follow up, no care. And our ACERT, I'm sure because you guys are from Alberta, you know um, that ACERT is very um, heavy on retired police being at those tables. So of course, there's never any accountability for the murders of our own people here. Um, and that's not even including when you get into the system, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Sonny Crazy Bull, he was arrested and within 90 minutes was dead after being processed. 
So, and I'm sure you all must have seen that horrible video that came from Calgary from that one police officer who like just hurt this black woman and she has recently uh, passed on because of the uh, pain and trauma that she was in endured from the Calgary police. Um, you know, like this is, this is such a major issue. How is, how am I supposed to feel safe here? How's my daughter supposed to feel safe here? So just wanted to open it up for you to talk about the book and some of the solutions and some of the concepts that you're really trying to promote because, you know, I, I talk about it, but I don't know if it, it just seems like it's too abstract for the general public to really understand. And, um, and I don't know why I, I I suspect it's racism and that commitment to white supremacy, but you know, I just want to throw it at you all to see um, how you think that we can start baby stepping the incredibly white supremacist privileged um, population into understanding what we're talking about. Um, maybe I'll I'll just jump in because everything that you were just saying, Michelle, as somebody who grew up in Calgary, absolutely tracks. Um, you know, the, the amount of violence, you know, when I heard that the Calgary police were refusing to remove the thin blue line patches, I was just like, well, yeah, of course they are like, absolutely. It wasn't even, I wasn't even surprised on par. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, like Edmonton's not much better, right. It's, it's like how willing are, you know, it's, it's less about what they really believe. I, I think, and more about, you know, how far or how seriously they take their PR campaigns. Right. I think we're seeing one of, I think the biggest shift we've seen in policing over the past two years has been how seriously they take public relations. Um, I mean, Edmonton's an amazing example of that. If you look back over statements that the chief has made from before 2020 to now, you, there's a massive shift. Um, but I think, you know, I think you're absolutely right that uh, white supremacy and settler colonialism are sort of the, the key features of policing and people's understanding of policing. And the state uh, and police themselves work really, really hard to promote a narrative that sees police as sort of these community members or these workers um, who, you know, are just here to uh, keep the peace or keep people safe when, you know, all of the research that has been done as well as lived experience, um, you know, from from black people, indigenous people, disabled people, poor people in our cities uh, and in, in rural communities. Um, you know, demonstrates that that is absolutely not what their role is their role is to maintain you know, it's to contain certain groups of people, it's to remove certain groups of people from certain spaces, and it's to maintain a specific kind of power differential among different groups of people. Um, and so, I mean, I tend to really turn to sort of systems thinking to sort of explain a lot of this. Um, and so, you know, our, I think uh, the Freelance Free Peoples chapter really dives into um, sort of how the systems of prisons and policing function in relation specifically to Indigenous people uh, as something that on the prairies, especially, uh, you know, police were sort of invented and specifically designed, right? The Northwest Meta Police, now the RCMP were, were developed specifically to quell indigenous resistance on the prairies. And that's, you know, a tradition that they've kept up, you know, over the past 150 plus years, uh, very happily, and you continue to see the results of that. And, you know, one of the things I think we need to look into uh, more is the ways or the relationship between local and federal policing. So local municipal uh, and sort of provincial police for those provinces that have that and the RCMP, because, you know, there's a lot of information sharing, um, intelligence sharing, training uh, that happens between these organizations. And so you can't just sort of say, oh, you know, um, there's a school resource officer in my kids elementary school and they're really nice so you know it's not all police, you know I think like the thin blue line. Um, stuff is a great example uh, that it doesn't have to be every single individual member of the police who's inherent like incredibly violent or white supremacist all it needs is you know, enough of them for that environment to be maintained and to recognize that the institution of policing on these territories functions very specifically and is functioning very well uh, and is doing what it is meant to do um and i'll maybe sorry i don't mean to dominate the conversation i'll get the opposite abby i'm so grateful you chimed in and uh vicky or abby do you want to um add in what you're hearing um yeah thanks molly and that running with the police and the other aspect too that michelle you were talking about was the media and the kinds of spectacles that created um, about these kinds of violences that continue the colonial narrative of, 
you know, the, the, of the dysfunction of the, dis, you know, of communities of, of, of violence and dangerousness that need to be policed. So the, that ongoing colonial narrative of savagery continues on through the media and the public that legitimates the policing violence and the policing actions and, 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 and what we've been seeing in these kinds of communities, whether it's the downtown east side or Calgary, where you're talking about the North End in Winnipeg. And then the other part of that is that spectacles have all kinds of functions, but one of them is that they disappear the quotidien violence, the day to day violence of poverty, child apprehensive, uh, water boil advisories, you know, even policing violence. So, on, you know, so you have these spectacles on one hand and then erasures on the other that continue that colonial legacy and it's and it distracts us right as these kinds of virtual voyeurs that get caught up in these titillating uh, images of, you know, of, of the, the crack cocaine user and the prostitute and all these kinds of things and, and really they just feed into these ongoing storylines that have been perpetuated since colonialism. Yes, agreed. I was. Yeah. Oh, I, I was going to say, and I'm actually going to invite Vicky to say more about her chapter uh, in a second because I think it's so brilliant in terms of illustrating uh, and the and the larger project that it comes from is so brilliant in terms of illustrating how how people are enacting in a way abolitionist futures uh, in the in the present. So you know, to your to your question about like how do we baby step our way towards defunding, I think part of it. And the book does this is sort of to denaturalize de police and prisons as sort of the only way that we have of, of dealing with things, uh, harms and such in society, right? And so many people just default to that. I think even if they've experienced uh, prisons and police as harmful, uh, there's such a discourse that naturalizes these systems that, that sometimes people don't look beyond them. So the book does a good job, I think, of denaturalizing, but then also looking at looking at alternatives and the ways in which people are enacting justice uh, and are taking care of each other within their communities because they have not been served by, um, by the police because the police you know, don't show up if they call or take a long time to show up or what have you, right? So people have had, it, people in, in multiply marginalized communities have had to take care of each other. So Vicky's chapter, I think, you know, and Vicky, you can speak to this in a second, has done an amazing, does an amazing job of, of uh, of providing an example of that. Um, there's also, there's also um, other chapters in the book that I think provide really great sort of concrete actions that, that can move us towards uh, abolitionist futures. The one chapter by uh, sex workers of Winnipeg, and I, I hope I do a decent job of summarizing this. Oh, you're laughing, Michelle. Have you read the, have you read the whole thing? Not at all. I'm just so grateful that they were included at all because, I, again, like we we're talking about stigma, like stigmatizing and propaganda, and and it's like you know that what I was taught about a sex worker growing up compared to what I think now, totally different uh, scenarios. And I'll get into that more later. But please continue your thought, and then of course we'll go back to the key. No, I think just just building on what you're saying, though, I mean, one of the pieces of feedback that we've heard about the chapter is or about the book is that there are three chapters actually that focus on sex work and the criminalization of sex workers and uh, how sex workers have to be at the center of abolitionist organizing. So um, and, and one of the chapters really makes strongly that the critique that even so called progressive movements tend to uh, invisibilize or marginalize or push out sex workers. So yeah, I think it's I think it's a really great point, Michelle. But the sex workers of Winnipeg uh, chapter, uh, which is called DIY Defunding the Police: How Winnipeg Sex Workers Stop the Police from Taking Drivers' Money, is just this hilarious example of a, a direct action um, that this this coalition of sex workers did, which was basically to find out you know, where, um, where there were high, high traffic spots where the police would be collecting fines from people for speeding. And then they set up an action there where they had signs saying, basically, you know, you're gonna be ticketed, so slow down, like this is a speed trap. Uh, and so then people needed to slow down because this money was going to fund the police, right? So it was this really like, it was this really strategic, awesome way. And then also they were like sex workers helping, you know, helping drivers or whatever. They had signs like that. So it was awesome. It was like a way of destigmatizing sex workers, but also defunding the police. Like I just, I love that chapter. It's hilarious. 
no, that is exactly the type of crap we need to be doing everywhere, frankly, like that, that's it, because we, humor, one, helps heal everything, but two, especially here in Calgary, like uh, Paul Brandt, the country singer, has a Not In My City campaign. Why is a country singer that lives in Nashville most of the time somehow in charge of the narrative in Calgary about sex work? Like, yeah, right, Vicky's like just laughing and just just keeling over because it just sounds ridiculous saying those words out loud, does it not? So thank God for the sex workers in Winnipeg for doing that action. And Vicky, I'll let you chime in here. <laughs> just really quick off topic, but you know, the uh, Abby, that story reminds me of how in Ontario they started criminalizing squeegee kids who were you know cleaning your windows. And I'm like, why don't they squeegee? Why don't they criminalize you know marketing? Like they they sell me crap I don't need and disturb me at 6 p.m. and harass and interrogate me. And squeegee kids are just out there and they're just creating like highway you know road safety by making sure that you can see through your window. Like it's terrible. You know these kinds of just undistributed weight but um okay but going back to the chapter and, and I apologize because I like to sort of like uh, I like to bring this into a, a story and how it how it comes about because I just I didn't just kind of I am an academic and I'm a terrible academic because I look I, I tell stories but and, and they don't <laughs> academics hate stories it's it's anecdotal <laughs> right so, <laughs> So I, but I came into this, uh, I came into this work, not because it was like, you know, a topic I wanted to study, but, you know, I, I, I come from abuse, I had those kinds of experiences, and it wasn't, didn't take much for me to, to link the abuses that I experienced in my own, in my own personal life with the violences that I was seeing in the prison. And so I came at, I came at abolition as, from, as an anti-violence worker, so I was doing work in a shelter uh, in, up in northern or central interior BC. And this is where um, I met Gladys Raddick, who's Gitsan Wet'suwet'en. She's one of the activists for the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. And uh, she was on one of her five national walks across the country. And these walks are over 4,000 kilometers. They last like they could last three to four months. And these volunteers, and what they do is they walk from community to community, raising awareness. But there is so much more to it than that. And, but when I met her, she was on one of these walks and she had stopped off in Quinell, BC, where I was working. So that's when I first met her. And then I met her again um, at a, 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 the Northern Women's Conference in Prince George. And then I was, you know, I was in on. Ontario and Ottawa on the belly of the beast, as Gladys says, and I'm at a take back the night march on Parliament Hill. And who's there but Gladys Raddick? <laughs> like, I'm like, man, this woman is everywhere. <laughs> I can talk to her, right? So serendipity. And so I started collaborating and working with her. And that was probably, oh, when was that? That was back in 2012. And so I started helping her on these walks. And, you know, the amount of energy and time and resource that she put into these walks to raise awareness. And she wasn't just raising awareness, but something I noticed when I helped her on her last walk, not helped, but helped organize and coordinate and fundraise and all those kinds of things was that, you know, she would actually go from city to city and she would carry the stories. And then she would take those stories and bring them to the next community and then she would share them and other people would share their stories and they'd share the images of the women that had the, the loved ones that had gone missing in their lives. And so she she knows hundreds of women's names, faces and stories and she carries them with her as she as she moves from from city to city so she's a weaver of family and community, right? Like it, it became so clear to me that she was a weaver. And so we went on, um, so I, I started to realize as I was, you cannot, as, you, as you're doing this work, you can't not start to see these kinds of things. And Gladys and I went on a cross country road trip, the two of us, where we were talking to the families and communities about, about their initiatives. So all the kinds of things that they started to, what they were doing in support of the missing and murdered indigenous women. So on one hand, we have these discourses of deprivation and uh, dysfunction. And when you actually go into the communities, like to be honest, I part of this, this work was I, I read not the final report, but the actual transcripts to the, to the national inquiry. We're talking thousands and thousands of pages of testimony. It took me a year, every night I would read the transcripts. And man, you know, the, the unimaginable hardship 
just from these transcripts, like I can't, you, you know, it's almost impossible not to cry from that. And, um, but at the same time, spectacular resource and creativity. Like, so you have these, these kinds of two, and this is exactly what Bell Hooks is talking about, that the margins or the so-called places of dysfunction, which is actually more functional and organized than I've ever seen in, in white settler society, is, is actually the, the, the greatest places of radical possibility. Mm. And so we started documenting all the kinds of initiatives that the family members were, were taking on and, and, and doing. And it was more than just simply raising, you know, and of course, again, the discourse is the colonial discourse, raising awareness, you know, calling for justice. And that's and, and that, that even the women themselves and the families themselves had their had their um, had their stories framed in that way, particularly through the National Inquiry, for example, is like these discourses of continuous victimhood where they always had to play the victim. The only way they could be heard is through these discourses of victimhood. But on the other hand, what we act what we're actually seeing, we started to document these stories and we'd see models of abolition models of community justice and i could i could give you hundreds i mean we collected so we did the cross country road trip and at the same time we collected over 500 uh through a national media scan over 500 grassroots indigenous led and based uh grassroots initiatives for the missing and murdered indigenous women it was a litany and uh, of of this remarkable uh resource and strength in indigenous communities and so, but I could give you, uh, you know, if I, I could talk a little bit about that because again, I don't want to like, dominate the conversation, but I can give you examples of, and we don't have to go far. So often people are like, well, what do we do in abolition? Like, you know, what's the alternative? I'm like, you don't have to go far. You know, but a lot of people have a hard time imagining what it's like not to have policing or justice or prisons. Like, oh my God, what would I do? Well, you know what? Indigenous communities live that. I, I, when I was in Northern BC, police wouldn't even go on reserve. They wouldn't even go on reserve because they thought it was a waste of their time and they, you know, there's too much violence. You, all those kinds of, all the storylines that you would hear. Like, so Indigenous communities actually live the reality of not having any justice. And if there is any justice, it's when they're criminalized and, or, or they experience violence from police. And they don't experience any kind of positive rapport and, and you know, just read the, the transcripts, you'll, anyway okay <laughs> oh no seriously every police interaction causes more trauma like that that is not even a question and in fact i have a friend who reached out to me last weekend and I, it wasn't even last weekend it would have been a week ago already um he had lost his cousin here in calgary i don't know the circumstances i was trying to get um the mother in con contact with the police and i'm not joking like it it was the long weekend and I just felt like there was there was no attempt. It was like, well, you know, the sister is here and that's good enough. Meanwhile, mom is uh, way up north beside herself trying to, you know, what happened? What happened? No communication from the Calgary police to her in, in any capacity. And, you know, it, it it's it's so frustrating. It's so upsetting. You know we have these so-called family liaisons now and what what are like exactly i seen your eye roll it was audible like that and that's how i feel right now because you know you give these resources but what do they do uh victim services you know they get um w they get back to you in a two-day um office week so i'm sorry but if something happens to you on a thursday night and you're not getting a phone call till wednesday we've already buried the the, the body by then you know um that's where it's at and you know, something I, I love hearing the three of you talk about this and this um, space for conversation uh, that we've never seen before. But I wanted to put a bit of a reality check. My last podcast talked about the Recovery Capital Summit that they had here in Calgary. And I'm sad to report it, it's basically a pro prison um, abstinence model that they want to impose here. Because as we know out here in the prairies, the settler community always votes conservative and Jason Kenney and his uh, My Alberta model is the one they want to institute nationally and through North America. And I know like he brought in so many American speakers and um, I, I don't know if you know, but a lot of the conservatives from uh, Alberta go down to the states to um, you know get brainwashed by Republicans on how to be more conservative. So, um, you know, we're, 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 end up, we're gonna go backwards really when it comes to this conversation about harm reduction and abolishing police and and frankly i witnessed you know all of these white settler 
um, social workers that were just like, oh my God, goodness, I'm so happy that we got to go on this weekend. We got to have some chicken and oh, Jason Kenny is just so great. Um, you know, so this was a real thing that happened. So that was my last podcast was talking about the intersectionality of that blue line patch. Uh, the racism within the uh, police seniors association and their union and how that is going to contribute negatively with this uh, pro prison abstinence model that uh, conservatives are going to be pushing so it, it's interesting because in one way we finally get to have like meaningful dialogue about what uh, um, abolishing police or or reforming justice in general um, and social work where we haven't really talked a lot about that because there's only so many so much you can talk about less than an hour with four people very passionate on the subject but that bigger picture that you know we still don't have social workers on side they are happy still contributing to the um you know justice domain and happily contributing to oppression of indigenous people and black bodies and uh people of color immigrants um oh that, that's another killing that the police did here it was very public uh, right on 17th Avenue here in Forest Lawn, where they murdered um, this this man had um, post traumatic stress disorder from being a child soldier in the South Sudan. And here we have Canada like, oh my God, we are so great. We're going to bring in all the refugees, we're going to bring in all the immigrants, but we have zero resources of mental health to give folks who are extreme in extreme trauma and dealing with the repercussions of colonial wars abroad you know bringing those displaced people here um and in systems like it, it's really upsetting to me um you know with the deepest respect to the ukraines i absolutely agree we should be giving them the health care the work transition all the things that are happening but it's been very clear out here in the east side of calgary that's racist because we did not accommodate so many people of color from all abroad with the same type of policies, despite there being an equal amount of pain, suffering, genocide, war, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, I, I don't mean to get off topic. I was hoping you'd all chime in and start interrupting me. Um, Abby, Molly, Vicky, is there anything more that you want to add about the book um, before we before we start wrapping up? Um, I'll maybe just uh, we'll launch into this because I mean, this is the other part of of abolition and Vicky's obviously started talking about this, but Michelle, when you were saying, you know, we're, we are, we're in a time of backlash for sure. I think between the TRC, between this movement for black lives, um, you know, white supremacy is battening down the hatches. Uh, you know, the conservatives are gearing up, right? We're seeing it all, all over the place. I mean, just the other day, um, you know, there was another clown parade of honking truck, whatever, I won't get into it. Um, but what I will say is that, you know, we, we can take inspiration from marginalized communities, from Indigenous communities um, who are not waiting for these edicts from on high to transform, to defund the police. We're not waiting till that budget mark hit zero uh, to start taking action. Um, and I think that that's really important, right? Like people, people tend to imagine abolition as this big, scary project project that, you know, it's, it's so hard to envision this. Anytime you don't call the cops, you are engaging in abolitionist work. Anytime that you approach conflict resolution or you address harm in a way that doesn't bring in the state, doesn't bring in cops, doesn't punish people involved. That's the kind of work that you're doing, right? One of, you know, and, and folks have said this and, um, I'm just sort of, you know, taking up what other people have said, but children uh, are often upheld as this amazing model of abolition because they're able to resolve conflicts among themselves without bringing in, um, you know, incarceration, without bringing in punitive long-term measures of shaming and blaming and, you know, this and that, right? The conflict gets resolved and kids can move forward with it, right? Uh, and that's what we can do too. And as Indigenous people, we have the additional benefit of we have justice traditions we have justice traditions that have worked on these lands and we have legal regimes that have worked on these lands that come from the land that we can turn to and that are still very very important in our communities to inform how we want to do conflict resolution how we want to address harm how we want to live together how we want to be in good relation with one another with the land with the other than humans that we share the land with right and that's i think speaking specifically just sort of an indigenous abolitionist perspective, you know, that expansion of our understanding of abolition, our understanding of carceral politics and systems to the land, to the other than human beings that we share the land with is really, really crucial and fundamental. 
um, to sort of the broader abolitionist project as a whole. Um, and so, you know, in our chapter, we talk about, um, you know, Korean Métis legal regimes and legal concepts that we like to take up um, that inspire our work and that are really helping us to situate and ground our analysis of how to move forward. And it's these laws, uh, these Indigenous laws and these Indigenous legal tradi traditions um, that are really I guess, structuring the work that we do as freelance free peoples. And so I really encourage uh, Indigenous people and, you know, and that's, again, to say, like, I come from a nation where one of our political leaders is sending out statements in support of the Winnipeg police in 2020, like just weeks after, you know, Winnipeg police basically went on a killing spree, right? Um, so, you know, it's within, this is work that we need to do within our own communities as well. But we can really look to our own people and the work that our own people are doing, the work that our ancestors have done um, to inform the work that we're doing today, because, I mean, they knew, right? The land knows. And we have to listen to what it's telling us, because this system is eating itself uh, and it's chewing us all up. So anyway, I will I will pass it along. Oh, I'm so grateful you chimed in. Um, I don't know, Vicky or Abby, if you want to talk, I just, you know, we have the Brave Dog Society that has... Um, really taking care of Southern Alberta up until colonialism. Like there's so many examples that we can work together with restorative justice circles, but yet, um, like, I mean, we can't even get Indigenous or non-Indigenous people to do friggin' land acknowledgements properly here, let alone talk about reconciliation, but the models are there. And I'm just grateful that you were all talking about this. And I should give a shout out to Bear Clan uh, here in Calgary. Like that is a great alternative, like you said, as opposed to, you know, calling daddy at the police station, you can call um, the, the Bear Clan. So Abby, I'll let you chime in here. I, I can't I can't top what Molly said so eloquently, but I did just want to point out that in our in our chapter we start with a discussion of uh, the work that happened in Saskatchewan over the course of the pandemic that was uh, in part in part led by a comrade of ours who since passed on, uh, Corey Cardinal. Uh, he was a, a Cree man, a, a advocate for his fellow prisoners and you know brothers in inside. Uh, and we start with talking about sort of the hunger strikes that arose in Saskatchewan that he helped to that he helped to lead and organize from inside the Saskatoon Correctional Center. And he worked with uh, people on the outside to sort of communicate information to people in other institutions. Because of course, if you're in an institution, you can't, you're not allowed to pick up the phone and call someone in another institution. So organizing is ex extremely complicated. Um, and there's lots of barriers to that. Uh, but organizing these, you know, over 100 uh, people involved in a hunger strike to, to protest the conditions inside prisons, which we know were exacerbated during COVID-19, but which are the same sort of horrific conditions that exist uh, existed in prisons, you know, since their since their inception and continue to exist. So, um, I just wanted to we, we like to honor Corey and, and his work in in most of the the talks that we do as freelance free peoples. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to say, I think it resonates with what Molly was saying about taking inspiration from people who are who are doing the work already. And one of the ways that we think about, you know, someone like Corey and how he was enacting sort of these systems of, of care uh, and, you know, Cree, Cree and Métis law around uh, relationships and around inter, inter, interrelatedness, right, is that he was he was doing that. He was doing that work from inside these systems that are very uh, clearly focused on fracturing relationships, but he was all about sort of building relationships, caring for other people and other other men and women and other people in in prisons across the province and beyond. So, you know, I, I think those sorts of examples of someone who is in this extremely sort of oppressive situation who's still enacting some of these core principles around care and uh, good relations is uh, is pretty pretty inspiring that's wonderful thank you and thank you for honoring him um yeah well, i hope to share some stuff about Corey now along with uh, this podcast so people can honor him properly vicky do you want to do you have any lasting thoughts that you want to add yeah just a couple of things just to you know building again off molly and abby the you know, that the, the system really is sick and that it's eating itself and we don't turn to the system. And I, I don't think, you know, and it's not just, you know, Indigenous folks or Black folks. It's just like a lot of, a lot of people can't turn to their, to the systems for healing. 
and that the systems don't take care of us. They make us sick and they make, and, and that not only are we, you know, so the system's eating itself and then we're becoming sick as a result. And that, and then that it's, it's amazing what Corey, that we are looking to people like Corey who model that kind of relationship building and the caring of self and care, um, caregiving, not taking, but just caregiving and cultivating each other. So yeah, I, I appreciate the, um, if you, I don't know if we, whoops, sorry scratch that from the podcast if you can <laughs> that last bit <laughs> the cat yelling at me. no don't worry about kitty <laughs> no i think it's important that we acknowledge Corey, and i think that um you know you did such a great job of kind of putting that all together and my hope is is that people will be inspired to join uh you know the justice exchange or the Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Alberta Abolition Coalition. Uh, these are really important things that we all need to be kind of focusing our efforts towards together. And uh, for me, today being 420, and I'm really thinking about harm reduction and thinking about folks that, um, that we've lost over the year, over ridiculous policies of incarceration, um, injustice, or just us, as my friend says, where it's like clearly not for all of us, but building on what you said, Vicky, you had, like many women will never call um, the police when in a dangerous situation because they know um, one, they won't be taken care of, taken seriously, taken care of in a positive way, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that just to validate that bigger point that who is the justice system even serving at this point? Um, and I, I know many people in my circles talk about it really just only benefits lawyers. And I think that is that really the society we want? Um, you know, in my opinion, no. Uh, so I think talking about different models and, and building on that was really important. So I just want to say thank you to you all for coming on my show. Um, I'm hoping people will have listened to the last one and this one together and realizing the state of so-called injustices we have here. And uh, yeah, I'm going to be doing some resource sharing and, and you're all more than welcome to kind of chime in as you uh, hear me speak and, and let us know about maybe some resources that are in your area so that we don't miss anything of importance there. Um, thanks again for being on my podcast. Thanks, Michelle. I, oh, I'm honored to have yeah, you all thank here. You. It was so, yeah, it was so great. You set such a great environment too. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Oh, that's so great. Energy. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Um, I'm really proud that this podcast has given solutions, cultural safety training, cultural faith, first aid, and all of them to create a safer space for Indigenous people, people of color, Black bodies, those with disabilities and LGBTQ2 plus to speak. Um, I want to say thank you to author Cheryl Ward, Chelsea Branch, Alicia Fritkin of heretohelp.bc.ca for creating what is Indigenous cultural safety and why you should care about it. Uh, their work in those cultural action tools, I've said in my podcast, so please support Indigenous work um, as part of your reconciliation work and settler understandings. I'm just lucky enough to highlight them and repeat them here. Same with our guests that we had today talking about the book. Um, so grateful. Internalized racism or lateral violence is another form of violence Indigenous and marginalized folks experience by the structure of racism imposed by these lands. Uh, Donna Bevins has racialequitytools.org with resource files and a really good one on what is internalized racism. So if you are a person of color, Indigenous person, LGBTQ2+, it's really important to understand internalized oppression. So even if you were to just Google it, you might find that right intersectionality that makes sense for you. Um, do's and don'ts for bystander intervention by American Friends Service Committee. Uh, this particular resource really kind of expands the idea of what you do when you see, you know, a Muslim woman on the sea train being, um, um, I, I guess, the recipient of, of racism, violence, um, negative um, interactions. So again, these are resources to not call the police, <laughs> but to what to do when you're in that um, in, in that environment. In uh, Alberta, if you see or experience racism, you can also report it at actandracism.ca. They have a text at 587-507-3838, and that's really done here by the um, Asian community in Calgary. So highly recommend at least another avenue to start um, cataloging these issues. 
Indigenous have been talking about our issues, sharing our traumas in reports, commissions, and public hearings, so it can be regularly disregarded. No more. Honor our words. Honor the treaties. Listen to politicians and their policies and platforms. If they don't recognize marginalized in their budget with gender equity plus, if they are cutting violence prevention programs and services, Indigenous education, harm reduction sites, uterus health choices, gay straight alliances, a lack of human rights for migrants, immigrants, uh, folks in prisons, folks with disabilities, know that your vote to that person or party directly negatively impacts marginalized people. Demand that they implement the Truth and Reconciliation Commission 94 calls to action, the recommendation of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, the multiple reports on child welfare reform, violence prevention programs, and now 231 calls to justice from the National Inquiry on Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, Girls, and Two Spirit. Denying these reports is a form of abuse called gaslighting. Our people are experiencing extreme racism in the educational justice and health institutions with multiple reports that say the same things. Demand change from election platforms and politicians if they don't understand colonialism, racism, privilege, ableism, sexism, they have zero business running. This should be understood by everyone, including community organizations, nonprofits, sport clubs, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. A really great article I said out loud in episode 62 is truth before truth how non-indigenous canadians become allies literally if you were just to google how to be an ally to indigenous people you will find multiple resources today if you're experiencing emotional distress after anything we talked about today and want to talk you can call the first nation and inuit hope for wellness helpline at 1-855-242-3310 it's toll free, open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They also have a website of hopeforwellness.ca that also has a texting feature. If more uh, related to missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two spirit, you can call 844 413 6649. It is a national 24 7 crisis line. For non Indigenous, there are distress centers in your area, usually a functioning 211 or you can call 833-456-4566. Uh, 60 Scoop Indigenous Society of Alberta has a website. And again, if you see any racism, you can report it to actandracism.ca or text at 587-507-3838. If you identify as LGBTQ2+, there is lifevoice.ca. Um, this is a, an umbrella of the Trevor Project. And you can have youth lines, trans lines, uh, youth support lines. So I highly recommend that as well. Violence is my everyday reality. Every Indigenous generation has faced it. That's why I started this podcast, to speak freely without interruption, without tone police, without leadership shaming, without gaslighting questions, as many people don't want to hear Indigenous opinions, but sure want to tell us theirs, even if they know nothing about colonialism, Indigenous people, the constant surveillance of our protests, vigils, and our rights, microaggressions, people dealing with internalized oppression and become gatekeepers and survive off the status quo. Internal and external racism is an everyday reality for Indigenous people. I want to say thank you to my ancestors, my granny, my mama, what strength looks like through your example. I want to thank my dad for teaching me to be strong and blunt. My stepmom for showing me what a proud culture is through her Austrian family and roots and teaching me to be a proud Calgarian. It is through her, I'm a second generation proud Calgarian, but I literally named this podcast Native Calgarian to make fun of non-natives who call themselves Native Calgarians. So if you are non-native, I highly recommend not calling yourself a native, enter your city here. Uh, thank you to my husband, Darcy, for producing and editing this show on top of being my husband my childhood friend, uh, the father of our child, he has supported my journey of the Red Road and has witnessed decades of racism and sexism to our child who we are blessed to learn from daily. I'm honored you chose us. You give me daily accountability to be a better and stronger person. Uh, for folks who know, uh, she has uh, COVID right now and she's doing better every day. Today is runny nose day. So we're hoping we'll be ready for Comic Con this weekend, but we'll see. Um, my hope is that my daughter and my family will be proud in the future of us trying to discuss these present day issues in a way that they can understand. Uh, my patron account is Native Calgarian, where you can pledge and support. Thank you to previous donors for showing your support. If you value listening or watching and can afford to give, thank you. 
To those who cannot afford to give, we'd love to hear from you at nativeyyc at gmail.com where you can send in your comments or your questions. We also have a YouTube channel that you can go and subscribe or go to nativecalgarian.com for the latest podcast Blah, 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 the latest podcasts and pin posts on social media. And I want to end by giving side eye to those Calgary rabbits. If you're lucky I'm not tradish. And my beautiful cousin responded, where you'd be in my dish. So thank you for listening, folks.